So yes, my name is Ima Farfan Velasco. I work, uh, I'm Spanish, based in Luxembourg. I work for the Publications Office of the European Union, um, and I work on data.europa.eu. And yes, today we're going to talk about open data, how it continues to improve lessons from the European Union. So I'm going to bring to you a specific use case, but we're going to extrapolate it and see how this can be applied to other use cases, such as in the New York City. And uh, so um, to go through the agenda, we will have a uh, next slide, please, Zachary. Okay, is there. So I'm going to present to you, first of all, and the Open Data Maturity Report in Europe. What is it about? Or what, do, what, what do we do about it? Then we're going to dive into the methodology and the different dimensions, uh, policy impact portal and quality, but extrapolating to understand uh, what New York City is doing on this respect. And then it's going to be followed up by a discussion and uh, questions and answers from your side. We will have, uh, well, we will welcome your, your interventions as much as possible. So before, I would like to give some context about data.europa.eu. So data.europa.eu, where I'm working, is the official portal for European data. So we bring together open data from different public administrations across Europe, which means that we have data sets from the European Parliament, supranational uh, entities, organizations, but also from national, regional, and local uh, administrations, for example, Spain, or uh, you know, my, my, my region in Sevilla, etc. So in total, we have 1.5 uh, million of data sets, 176 catalogs, 36 countries participating, uh, but we don't only collect and put data uh, as a bed with for, uh, for information. We also try to make it as compelling as possible for the general audience. So we have many uh, data stories and news pieces, uh, over 200. And we also have a data learning hub uh, on for open data that I invite you to go through it whenever you have some time. So it's the Data Europa Academy. Uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, Europa U is managed by the Publications Office together with uh, GD Connect and the European Commission. So uh, going to understanding what is the Open Data Maturity Report. Um, um, so I'm going to introduce you to one of the key publications that we have. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the Open Data Maturity Assessment is one of the most important publications that we have at the level of uh, Data Autoreport.eu and Europe. It's an annual assessment uh, with which uh, share the state of open data uh, across European countries. So we do it at national uh, level. It's conducted since uh, 2015. So this last year, 2022, was the eighth year. It was published, the last publication in December. We will publish another one at the end of the year in 2023. Um, and uh, we uh, benchmark, uh, we use it like a, as a benchmark between different countries across Europe, not only European Union, but also other countries, uh, to understand how they are, uh, the, how they are um, doing with their open data policies, with their implementation, what are the pitfalls, and also bringing some recommendations for them. So as I was mentioning before, we have 35 part, uh, participating countries, which means that we don't only have the, uh, the, the European Union uh, as such, we also have EFTA countries such as Norway or, or Iceland, uh, but we also count with candidate countries who also want to be part of this exercise such as Montenegro, Ukraine, etc. So you can see that this um, use cases and, and this uh, type of assessment can be useful for actually beyond the European Union kind of uh, legislative landscape. And why is this uh, type of uh, exercise important? Because we need to gain insight about what's happening in different countries. We need to share knowledge. And we also have to understand where we come from and where we head to. And in order to do that, we need assessment, we need analysis, we need to share best practices. So this type of assessment is an opportunity, yearly opportunity, to bring together these open data representatives to see what they're doing, what are their, their opportunities, challenges, and discuss them and put them together in a paper. And how do we do this? So it's uh, done based on a self-assessment. So we are in contact with official open data representatives uh, at the level of the ministries. Uh, so it would be one, per one person working at a governmental level. And we send to them this uh, questionnaire that they fill in internally. Uh, and after we have some own uh, desk research and quality check and feedback runs with them to ensure that the final um, scoring and the final assessment is in line between uh, uh, both parties um, and according to the different dimensions. Okay, but talking about dimensions, uh, next slide. 
so as I was mentioning before, we have uh, four different dimensions. It's true that the methodology and, and the assessment from 2015 until now has been evolving. And we aim to make it uh, um, develop it in the, in the future because we can see that there are different trends, there are different uh, uh, tendencies in the future, and we have to adapt according to what's happening now. So already from 2015 to 2017, we only had two dimensions or two indicators that were maturity and readiness, but we saw that it was not enough. So in 2018, we expanded to the four dimensions that you can see here, policy impact, portal and quality. So um, in terms of policy, we study in this specific dimension, what are the open data policies and the legal framework that the countries are uh, establishing and adopting in their own countries in place. So we also uh, deep dive into the national governance models and the different measures that they implement. But we have to say that in this particular methodology uh, in 2022, we did some kind of revision. And uh, in the policy dimension, we wanted to streamline certain questions. We didn't want to only know what was happening at national level. We wanted to understand also what was happening at regional and local entities. So we added some uh, questions or specific uh, points on this aspect to understand what was the level uh, there of uh, like trying to have another level of uh, granularity. And also we added some information, some questions on high value data sets. As you may know, in the open data community, um, the, in, uh, in the European Union, it was adopted very recently the, the implementing regulation on high value data sets. So basically uh, trying to uh, create a single market of data based on um, releasing and publishing data that can be of added value for the economy. So geospatial data, mobility, um, many other different aspects under certain conditions. So they want to boost this data sharing. And um, we wanted to understand, see, we're in a key moment now of this uh, legislative process. We wanted to understand what they're doing now on this respect. Are they already working on this or not? Um, also, uh, like moving from policy to impact. So impact, we mean like all these activities to monitor and to, and to boost data reuse. It's true that we realize that um, impact sometimes is a bit challenging to really understand the cycle or the impact of uh, open data. So uh, in this methodology, we wanted to emphasize that. And we added uh, questions and specific uh, sub-indicators, such as maturing reuse and creating impact on governmental, social, environmental, and economic level. Then for uh, the portal, uh, all these participating countries at national level, they have their own open data portal. So we try to, uh, we study with them the level of, um, the level of the, of the usability and accessibility of this portal, the sustainability, what is the data that they provide, uh, and whether they have the features necessary to really engage with the audience and, and provide good services to citizens. And then just last but not least, we have also the quality dimension. So are all those measures adopted by uh, portal managers to harvest metadata and data across, uh, across the different uh, administrations? So these questions are relating are related to common standardized uh, processes and metadata mechanisms in order to uh, make data interoperable and, and, and linked to one another. And next slide, please. So um, to show you how it looks like, so the average score of these participating countries in 2022 was 75%. So Portal keeps performing uh, at the same level, so 82, because it's like the most mature part of the whole methodology. A impact is true that with this uh, reshifting of the, of, the, of the questions and really try to emphasize the importance of this matter, but the complexity of it, it, it went down to 65%. Uh, quality keeps stable with 60, uh, 72 and um, and policy uh, it keeps uh, on the same line also with some developments. Um, also, there's another manner to there's another way that uh, that we try to see these countries. So we cluster them in four groups. So the four groups are, are beginners, followers, fast trackers, and trendsetters. Um, so depending on which group you are and the and the year in and the year. Uh, you will see that there are some, um, there's more importance on one dimension than another one. So for example, for beginners, they give like a lot of importance to policy and governance because they want to create this like uh, as a priority in order to develop and improve more like the portal impact and other dimensions. 
Uh, whereas trendsetters, for example, are more advanced on impact uh, of open data. They already have tools for that, or they're developing ways to uh, they're developing ways to do it. Uh, whereas fast trackers, for example, they have better uh, scoring on data quality, for example, because they may be in a moment of of the process in which they gave more importance to that. So these are the typical uh, typical things that you realize when you cluster. Different, uh, different countries all together, you realize that in somehow even they're like completely split uh, filling, up, filling up these questionnaires. Some of them, they are behaving on there in the same uh, step in the whole process. Next slide. So then now it comes the interesting part in which I will invite my uh, Zachary to, to, to intervene. So we are going to dive into the different dimensions, but also I will want to hear from the New York City to see how they see themselves in the different dimensions. So uh, the first one is in terms of policy. So as I was mentioning before, we go into, into the dimension of, uh, of the governance and implementation, what are the action plans behind. So in general, um, we saw that 70% of these countries are following an hybrid model. And this is also in kind of federal countries, uh, for example, like with a federal structure, for example, Austria, Germany, or, 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 uh, or Belgium. Um, but also from a geographical point of view, we see that this may change depending on the country we're talking about. So for the less populated countries, they follow a more top-down approach from like, and these are the cases of Malta, Estonia, or Slovenia. So we see that depending on the structure and the country, they may have different type of uh, decision making uh, behind of the organization. Um, and one example, like uh, best practice, we have Cyprus, uh, Spain, and Ireland. In case of Ireland, why he is like trendsetter uh, in policy? Uh, because they um, they implemented, they adopted the open data, they transposed the open data directive uh, recently into Irish uh, Irish law. So it's something already very good news. But they wanted to go one step further, so they developed what is called the official uh, governmental um, uh, governmental circular. So they want to facilitate this knowledge in with the public administration. So they give some guidance on how it can be transposed and how they can, if this directive can be um, implemented. But now I want to hear from the New York City. So uh, Sakari, uh, tell us about your experience when you were uh, going through this dimension. So yeah, thinking about this dimension, I think the first thing that comes to mind is um, we, how fortunate we are here in New York City to have an open data law. Um, it was passed in 2012, so um, now over 10 years ago, but that is um, the foundation for a lot of the work that we do because it, it's not a policy um, that, that changes um, year to year, but really um, a, a requirement that, that will persist for every agency and um, data sets that are created and maintained are required to be published by default. And for any kind of exception, um, whether due to, to privacy or security, um, and, and those are also, the, those sort of exceptions are explicitly identified in the law. Um, that, that is exactly that, the exception. And, and um, we look to make those reasons for why data sets can't be published available as well. Um, but I think the other piece that, that I've found and we've found really important here is how we um, translate that that policy into into action, um, and and one way of doing that is through um, the document or the the screenshot of one piece of the document um, on the right side of the screen. So we have a, a technical standards manual that sort of gives um, a, a step by step approach from the identification of this data exists and should be made publicly available to um, actually publishing it to to then sharing it uh, with the public actively and and all the different um, things to think about and um, tools and and resources for for each of those steps. So in, in especially um, something that, that really resonated is the idea of these high value data sets and, and how we can, um, e even in, in a single city, the, the compar comparison or the prioritization um, of data sets can be challenging. And, and one of the ways that we, we have done that is by taking those components of, of the law, but also looking at things like demand or, or agency missions um, and, and seeing how those map onto or translate to the publication of, of different data sets. And then um, with that and, and thinking about the governance structure, um, we, we definitely have more of, of a distributed model here. Whereas I mentioned in the beginning, we have a centralized open data team 
um, in, in our office at the um, Office of Technology and Innovation. But then also, um, and this is actually something else that's enshrined in law here, we have these open data coordinators, one at each city office and agency throughout New York City's government. Um, so it's a combination of our own centralized standards, but then agencies, um, given their, again, um, specific topics and, and areas of, of practice and work, need to have their own standards. And, and these open data coordinators will, um, in some cases, uh, be, be taking data in from an agency that employs 100,000 or, or more people and, and, and trying to make some sense of that and then communicate that to the public. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I don't know, Emma, if you had any questions there or... Um... Um, yes, actually, I was, uh, I think you made a very good point on the, on the, the importance of um, moving from the policy to action, actually, because sometimes it's the, it's the most difficult part of the whole process. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's very interesting to hear about the open data coordinators uh, part in the New York City and how you collaborate with one another, because uh, I think it's important to have some kind of representative and official appointment in order to, uh, you know, uh, um, have like a more uh, organized structure in this, uh, on this respect. Is that something, the, the idea of having these representatives, that, that's a common structure across the, the European um, maturity assessment, especially for those who have a more distributed model? Sorry? Is, is that the idea of, of these um, coordinators or, or these representatives, something that you found to be common um, in the, the European assessment, especially? Oh, yes, sorry. Those, sorry. Those um, yes, yes, of model. course. Yes, of course. And actually, um, it's something that we saw very clear from the beginning, because is somehow each uh, national government, they may have their own way of acting. So uh, with the European Commission, there are some uh, open data representatives, we, we call it, and these are the people who are actually participating in these assessments. And um, there are working groups and there's like a further collaboration there because if no, it is, is, is impossible and they need to yes. talk to each other. When you are creating a sort of uh, single market of data, there has to be like some, some uh, Yes, some roles and some coordinators behind. So uh, it's something that I see very much reflected, but maybe in a, in a bigger scope. You do it than the New York City, and we do it at the European level, but it can serve for Of both. course. Great, great, great. Um, regarding that, if you want, we can move to the to the next uh, dimension, uh, Thackeray. So great. So now it comes the part of the impact, uh, <laughs> the one that was like uh, reshifting to a new methodology. So um, zooming in into, into, this, uh, into this dimension, it's true that we did some sort of uh, restructuring. We saw that the strategic awareness was the one that was still uh, is kept with the same uh, scoring because somehow there is, like a, a, there, there is awareness about the importance of impact, the importance of measuring it. It's only that sometimes we don't have all the harmonized tools for that. So that's why uh, that's what we saw during the whole method uh, the, during the whole methodology. And actually from the part of that to the two, we're trying to study ways to better measure impact uh, with all stakeholders. So they are com coming up some reports this year about that. Um, but also we have to see in which angle we want to study that in terms of government, social, environmental and, uh, and economic. Um, so in this specific case, uh, these uh, countries that we, we took into consideration were the Czech Republic, France, and Italy. Uh, to better know their stories, I would invite you to go directly to the, uh, to the report to read more about that. Um, but for example, the Czech Republic, we saw there's like a huge improvement of 14%. And we were wondering how is this possible, but actually they have been very active on this role. So they created a, and they launched a project uh, that is called National Environmental Reporting Platform. And basically they want to put there all the available uh, sources, uh, data resources, but also linking to the uh, potential impact uh, at social, uh, political, legislative level. So they want to create a specific project in which they, they, they showcase the importance of uh, data for, for environmental aspects. Uh, but they also want to go beyond that because as I, uh, we were mentioning now, we're in the moment where countries have to transpose uh, like and follow up on this high value data set uh, uh, regulation. But in this case, Czech Republic uh, wanted also not only to spot and, and to highlight this data set as high value data set, but they also want to link it to use cases, which is something that, that in my opinion, and we can discuss it later, it was very, very interesting because at the end of the day, you, you may say that some data sets are of, of high, value, high value impact, but actually if you don't link it to a specific uh, 
use case, uh, it's, very, it's very difficult to really understand what's the innovative product or service that you can create with this. So this is something that is ongoing and, uh, and they are working on, and we look forward to see, to see the results of uh, this exercise. Um, but Zachary, I saw also that you uh, spotted the Open Net Ambassadors, uh, very interesting uh, uh, wording. So we'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, we actually have an Open Data Ambassadors class um, later today at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. We will be having our, our final class of, of the week although um, there, there will certainly be more classes to come throughout the year. But this is a program that we run in collaboration with the civic tech nonprofit Beta NYC that also works with us on Open Data Week. And the idea is that there's a introductory curriculum and really just uh, um, a background of, of the history of, of open data and the open data movement here in New York City and some information on how to find and find data sets on New York City open data. And then um, a walkthrough of, of one of those data sets, specifically our 311 service requests for, for non-emergency um, government services. And then just um, people learn how to, to, to analyze that data, how to visualize it, um, to make a map, to make a bar graph, um, to, to be able to take a, a chart of that data and the, the, the idea of the ambassadors piece is these classes are taught by volunteer ambassadors, um, just New Yorkers who are enthusiasts about open data and interested in sharing some of that knowledge with people um, across, the, across the city. And they come from a variety of backgrounds. We definitely have some who work um, with city open data as, as government employees but others who are just um, data enthusiasts who work with data professionally, um, some people who are librarians, some people who are teachers, and um, really just the, the core unifying concept is people who want to share their knowledge with other mm -hmm. New Yorkers and, and share this um, repository with different communities around New York City. Um, and I would say that we are actually recruiting now. So um, if anyone watching this is interested in becoming an open data ambassador, you can find out more there too. Um, but I think one thing in what that I, I found really interesting is this idea of, of measuring reuse and, and, and sometimes how challenging that could be, especially since the um, information that, that we share is, is freely available. Um, it doesn't typically require some sort of registration. Um, and and the, the different tactics that, that people can that, that governments can use to understand mm -hmm. where that reuse comes from and, and how to, to best, um, best support it. Yes, I, I agree. Actually, um, when you're discussing with uh, different, uh, when different countries, um, there are some of them that think that sometimes one strategy that you can follow in order to measure impact could be directly monitor the data sets. So whenever uh, with DOI, so so whenever there's somebody using a data set for, for another product or a research paper, you can see that it has been used. But others may not agree because it's not, uh, I mean, it can be, but then uh, can you actually see what's the, I mean, here we can see the quantity of mentions that we have, and we don't see the quality of the end product. Maybe you can be used once, but then for uh, an added value application or service that you create, and then make, maybe it's making more impact than being uh, renamed thousands of times on a research paper. But we don't know. That's why like, there's, like there was like a whole discussion about it. But uh, it's true that sometimes bringing uh, people together, organizing events, uh, hackathons, can be also very useful uh, for that. So, um, for example, France, that was one of the countries on the, the best practices, they organized several uh, events with uh, users and reusers. That is something that in some is very much linked with your initiative, because you, we need to, you, you need to talk to them at the same time. They, it cannot be like a... Uh, direct uh, linear information like from data providers, data holders to the society and basta. We need there needs to be some discussion and and and, uh, and feedback rounds in somehow. Yeah, I, I could not agree anymore. I think that connection between this abstract sense of making data available and the specific real world issues and and problems and challenges that it represents is, is so so important. Um, the, the, the connection to um, advocates or um, issue experts is something we're always trying to work on. I think Open Data Week is a, is a good example of that and, and really um, 
enabling city agencies to come out and talk about the data they manage, but it's also sort of bring in their natural constituents, the people who really care about the topics that they work with and may not be um, particularly data savvy, but could learn more about um, what information is available and how they might make use of it or how others are making use of it. Yes, yes, that's true. For for the time being, it seems to have an undergoing discussion. Maybe one, one day we, we will end up having the perfect equation to, to measure impact. <laughs> and today we will keep uh, exploring. Um, great. That, that, that uh, equation would be a, a great uh, event to have. But um, I guess one other thing that we think about here for impact is um, the, the use cases. And I, I know, Inma, you've, you've mentioned this, and actually there was a session earlier in the week, um, and the recording of that will be available if you weren't able to make it on the EU's use case observatory, which is really just this wonderful repository of, of different ways that European data has enabled people to um, understand more and, and, and to um, do more things with their information. Um, one thing that we've done in New York is um, continually solicited um, examples, um, sometimes reaching out to, to groups and people proactively, um, sometimes receiving the, these projects. So the idea is just people who have taken a data set and made a tool or a visualization or some sort of um, some sort of, of, of use of it, um, which at once serves to um, to to share like what what's possible with this this data set or with open data in an abstract sense, but also um, provides a, a really useful um, starting point for somebody who may not be um, as data savvy as, as somebody who wants to look at the, the raw tables um, and, and analyze that themselves. And, and now they have um, some sort of explanation and, and direct access to um, the, these expert created tools. Yes, um, yes, I agree that using uh, projects and use cases can be also uh, very useful. And, and thank you for uh, like uh, mentioning the use case observatory indeed. I also shared the link in terms of, uh, is of interest of the audience, so we took 30 use cases, and we're going to track progress uh, in the in three, in the three year span to know what is the, the, the evolution uh, over time and really to understand what is the impact that they provide at a governmental uh, scientific uh, like um, uh, level. So um, okay, so I think we can maybe move on to the to the third one that is a portal. So this for us is the most mature. And dimension that we have, because since somehow, since they already have their open data portals, we only have to see what are the developments that they create from one year to another, how they can keep track of the data sets, broken links. It's, it's a bit, in my in my opinion, for example, I think it's more it's easier to 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 understand and keep this progress, no? And so, uh, as as best practices, uh, we had France, Poland, and Ireland. So here we have a very different use case. I want to mention to you both. And uh, so. France, for example, they give a lot of importance on communicating with uh, resources, something we saw uh, in this report. They want to they organize events, they organize hackathons for that, but they also um, keep the communication going on, ongoing with them. So they, uh, for every time that they highlight and they have new data sets, they create a specific publication to be distributed with all the users to inform them that this data set is, is upcoming. Uh, which is an interesting exercise uh, because it somehow it uh, it leverage and, and and it really brings like a new new communication uh, tool with citizens because they can also like report back and have like a uh, like the, uh, like a longer discussion with them, but at the same time. Um, sometimes it's not only the fact of having a portal, which is very important. I'm not going to diminish that, but also. Um, how do you provide more visibility to the portal? If you are, for example, um, publishing on uh, open so, uh, source code. So for example, in this case, most of these uh, countries, they publish on GitHub and GitHub GitLab. Uh, but it's true that Poland is one country where specifically they also publish content and they get in touch with developers in the field. And they use other different platforms such as Dane or uh, uh, Podatki. So in this case, you, we, you can see that they want to expand and and they want to uh, provide the data available on other sources, for example, that I'll talk about you in this case. And if somehow you give more gateways to this information, and then it's easy, easier to be accessed by, by people. Um, 
But uh, yes, well, what uh, what do you think, Thackeray, about that? And what's your what's your perspective? I, in terms of I love the example of um, France sharing um, the information about new data that's published proactively with people. It, it, it's so easy for for data sets to appear, um, and and certainly um, you you can always if you're seeking them out, you can you can look at them and um, find what. Mm -hmm. What, what, what's been what's been shared, but for people to get that um, sent to them with that kind of context, that, that that's such an important um, point of of getting people to actually make use of this information. One thing that we've done in the last few years is started to make this dashboard that we use internally available to the public. So the idea is, and you could just see a, a little brief screenshot of it here, but. Um, what agencies have data, what data sets do they have, how, how large are they, but also have they been updated um, when they're supposed to, what is the, the plan for other publications. So it's something that we use ourselves, it's something that is used um, by those agencies and those data coordinators throughout those agencies, but also used by the public. And in this case, um, we make the data available and that dashboard available, but also, and I think importantly to your point, um, have that same source code available. So this is reproducible. Nice, a very, very good initiative. Actually, from uh, from this make me think also like from data to you, um, we also have a kind of um, dashboard that is a bit, uh, a bit different. So we don't only showcase the number of data set, but we also try to uh, give uh, feedback, uh, feedback and metadata uh, uh, metadata assessment uh, to countries about that. So we try to, um, for example, if you have a specific catalog that you publish as, a, as an open data representative, um, we give like a kind of a scoring and we try, we will inform in the future, it's a project, uh, project ongoing now, we will inform in, in, inform in the future to data providers when there's a broken link, when the, the scoring is going a bit down in terms of quality, so they can fix it quickly and then they can keep this level of, uh, of quality somehow. Um, I guess that seems like a great segue to the last of the questions. Exactly. <laughs> yes, and then we can move on to the discussion. But uh, yes, it's one of the initiatives that we have. We also have data metadata quality uh, guidelines and data citation guidelines. In case you are interested on, on this topic, we also have this uh, at, on data. But in terms of uh, zooming into the policy dimension, um, it goes into uh, the dimension that in which fast uh, fast trenders feel more um, uh, co uh, comfortable with the work more on this level. So we try to um, boost and, and to in and to uh, promote the use of DCAT AP, for example, that is the APP model uh, for data portals uh, in Europe. So we have this data uh, catalog uh, vocabulary in order to. Um, like both interoperability and also um, ensure linking data. Um, so here, these are some of the aspects, technical aspects that we see. Uh, so we try to st we study here how, what are the portal managers doing in order to improve the quality data cleaning, uh, if they provide the accurate metadata, data licensing and everything, uh, which might seem a bit <laughs> straightforward, but sometimes it can be more difficult in the whole process, especially if you are uh, automizing everything. Um, so in this case, uh, we have a Ukraine, France, and, um, and Norway. So here, um, it was very interesting to see that especially uh, uh, Norway, or even like Switzerland, that is not, is not highlighted here, they have especially monitoring of uh, quality of metadata, and they use that metadata, uh, metadata quality uh, assurance for that. So we see that they are using this as a reference, and it can be useful for them. Which makes it even like more important that to to keep it uh, to keep it updating it, but also the Swiss data portal they they have a specific um, uh, section on that. And Norway they have a specific publication assessing the metadata of their portal, so they really try to uh, keep keep track on their progress on data quality and and to see what can be done uh, better in, with this publication. Um, but what about uh, New York City? How is it? How is it in there? We we have been focusing a lot on data quality over the last couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you, you mentioned at the beginning that, that some of the countries that have been um, working on open data for a while, the, the focus on um, impact and, and not to say that we haven't, but, but sometimes um, we, we found that we almost have like circled back to some of the things. And as the, the definition for open continues to expand and, and we, we continue to mature, um, like revisiting some of our previous 
policies and standards. So with that, we develop this self-assessment checklist that we give to city agencies. Um, and this is a, a portion of the checklist and the screenshot. Again, you can, you can see the full checklist at the link, but um, the idea is that before the data comes to our team, where we then screen those data sets, there is a, a list of things that we expect to see for each of these data sets, no matter where the data comes from, the same kind of um, quality checks are being conducted. I, I think a, a really interesting point here is, and, and, and something we, we continue to think about, is the difference um, and between, or, or the, the different challenges rather, um, with, with thinking about the kind of intrinsic metadata. Um, so, uh, what, when, when the date when the data set was last updated or um, the number of um, rows and columns or the, the name of the, the publisher, um, things that could to some extent be automated and that kind of contextual um, extrinsic metadata that, that can only be generated by a person sort of explaining in, in plain language what the data means. And, and we'd love to hear more about how that's um, thought about in both this assessment and then among the countries there. Yes, so in this respect, uh, I have to say that uh, there are some countries already that are working on their own data quality guidelines, and uh, sometimes they're even using um, this uh, metadata and data quality from the publications office uh, on that observatory as a reference, but also, um, you know, as a reference, but then of course they may have some particularities in the specific country that they want to address or specific uh, quality uh, pitfalls or opportunity that they want to measure specifically. So, um, for example, I think it was the Italian, uh, Italian uh, government that they were uh, undertaking this type of uh, activities, which means that it's very good because we see that there's so importance there. And sometimes it's, uh, what I see very interesting that, for example, in our metadata quality, we go into good practices and, be and, and bad practices to show what is supposed to be good or bad, you know, so the good and the bad uh, practice. But here there's actually a checklist that could be like even like a bit more factual and, and easier in some uh, in some cases and also from an open data provider perspective can be even useful this type of you know this type of format so it's a, it's an interesting point um, I, I love the idea of, of the bad practices I think there, there's nothing like a good counter example to um, give people a sense of, of what to do yeah, um, yeah absolutely I think with that um, I think we can open it up for questions um, I'm going to stop sharing, and then I think we can also um, have people unmute themselves if they would like to um, to chime in. So feel free, depending on your setup, to either put questions in the chat um, or to come off mute or uh, or to raise your hand um, virtually and come off mute, please. But but either way, otherwise, um, in my, I'm happy to to answer any questions you have, and I, I certainly have some some more for you. So if you want, we can leave a couple of seconds. If not, I can break the ass with my with my first question. And then we see if uh, somebody wants to intervene. Uh, so uh, I actually had the first question for you, Zachary. So um, you took the, like, actually it was your idea to, to, to go beyond the Open Data Authority Report and, and see how it could be done uh, at the New York City level, which was, uh, for me, a very interesting uh, exercise and that's why like this session has like a completely new and different fresh, uh, and fresh angle so um i would like to know like uh with this methodology this question that we share with you what what do you think about it uh what do you think it can be extrapolated uh, in which way which uh part of it do you think can be real for which one is not yeah i think there, there are certainly some specific regulations that we have and you have where um, they may be roughly analogous, but there's enough difference there that we, we can't really evaluate ourselves on, on that criteria and, and, and probably vice versa. But by and large, it's, it's kind of remarkable how no matter where you are in the world, and this is looking at this maturity index, but talking to other countries um, and other cities as well, where um, really the same challenges, the same fundamental problems um, where of, of taking this information that was sort of created for internal government use and, and making it accessible to everyone um, apply. But um, I, I think that there, there's a lot there that, that is um, either things we're working on or, or certainly things we've, we've discussed. 
one of the, the challenges that we always have is, is how do you, and I think you talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but how do you um, prioritize between these, these different dimensions? It, it, it always feels like there are only so many people and so many hours. And um, I, I know you mentioned like some dimensions have gone down over years and, and some have sort of stayed steady, but, but how, how, what have you heard from people and, and countries about that prioritization exercise? Actually, when, when uh, these countries are undertaking this exercise, you can already see which ones are maybe the, their main priority for, for the year. It doesn't mean that it has to be like a, like a, a stable priority for like forever. But for example, as we were mentioning before, um, these different clusters of countries also show that. So depending on the moment, of, uh, the moment in which you are, you may be uh, giving more priority to the quality or maybe onto data, data policy, because now there's like the high value, uh, high value data sets implementation. Uh, whereas for example, um, I don't know, those countries that are not into this EU uh, landscape regulation, they don't have to, they don't have this uh, urgency to, uh, to go into high value data sets. So maybe next year you will see that they're not investing time on it because it's not their priority, but they may invest more on Porta, for example, or impact. So, um, it really depends on the country. That's why when they are filling in this questionnaire, uh, we make sure that we um, exchange with them ideas. We also hear from them. And also, um, we also undertake like a more in-depth exercise because uh, from the publication of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the report, we want to also hear from them and uh, making all this information easier, digestible in chunks, no? So um, what we are doing now are some uh, webinars uh, done under the Data Europe Academy with these countries where they can specifically explain what they did, why they scored this, uh, score, uh, this specific uh, ranking, where, what are they doing uh, on this respect, but also data stories and uh, news cases in which we try to, uh, we, we bring this information in a more digestible manner to, to the audience. I guess with that, there is a question in the chat from Flora. Oh who is asking how you are planning to continue the collaboration between NYC and EU. Um, I think one, one way of, um, for first of all, I, I, we, we've had um, the European Union, I think now is our, our second year, um, at least in, in recent memory, but I, I think the, the, this collaboration around Open Data Week has, has been ongoing. Um, but certainly um, Open Data Week is one week of the year and, and the rest of the year. One thing that I find um, particularly helpful, especially when we started thinking about like, what, what do we even mean by data quality um, is looking at what people have made public. And I, I think one of the lovely things about the open data movement, it's very much connected with the open government movement. Um, and and a, um, a lot of countries, states, um, cities have made the resources they use internally available publicly. So we certainly try to do that. And it, it's always wonderful to see um, like the, um, EU's um, academy, the Data Europa's academy, when, when those resources are are accessible um, to people outside of the the primary audience. Um, I cannot agree more. Mm -hmm. So um, also, I I was wondering, based on this conversation we were having before, um, who are the stakeholders that, as a New York City Open Data Portal, who are the stakeholders you are working with? Who are your data providers? Because in somehow I had a feeling that I was uh, going to a very target group that are public administrations, even it's like a very big group in the end because it's a very big family. Uh, but um, from the New York City perspective, are you working also with uh, private entities or, or academia, universities? How, how does it work in your, in your, on your side? So we, we definitely, um, the data that we have officially published is, is from those um, with a few exceptions from those public entities. We, we have some, some data sets that we've published as like more individual exercises. Um, so for example, one that's in the realm of, um, I guess what you would call like citizen science, where a few years ago, there was a, a census of squirrels that was taken in, in the city's central park. And that is a, a data set, certainly where there's no um, city um, purpose behind that, that sort of census, um, but that, that is one of the data sets that we make publicly available and um, very much have, um, want, as we continue to put those governance structures in place, would like to move from a website that has data from New York City government to a website that just has sort of authoritative data about New York City. Um, but the idea of um, 
opening up to to other publishers and, and other entities um I, I think is is always it, it, it's wonderful but also has its own its own challenges um i guess are, are there any countries within your um majority report that you found that would that did that particularly well and like any any tips there yes actually it's something that uh that um, I think it's a, it's a common issue that uh, is discussed at, uh, at different levels, no? It can be like local, regional, or, or national. Um, for me, um, it's true that sometimes you want to, since uh, people working on open data, you want to uh, share data as much as possible. But it's true that sometimes you have to put boundaries on the, on the partners that they, they, they belong to it or make sure that they are reliable resources in whom you can count on. I think this second part is, is very, very important, it's essential. Um, Absolutely. I think there's nothing worse as a, a consumer of data than to find a wonderful data set and to see it hasn't been updated in, in ages or, or to have it suddenly stop updating because there, there's some um, breakdown in that process. And it, it is certainly, while not easy, um, it is easier if, if they are um, public entities that have some sort of direct um, government connection to the, the stewards there. I see there's actually, a, yes, sorry. I was just going to say, I, I, you, you go, go ahead. No, I was going to just complete on that, that actually uh, with adoption of uh, the Data Governance Act, uh, that is something that also uh, uh, was adopted in doors like no, no long time ago, like a couple of uh, months ago. Actually, countries are seeing how actually to solve this and to provide a national single access point, uh, single information point of all these uh, different small portals, regional, local portals. So, okay, we give one, entry point of access and there's European uh, there, there's going to be a European single access point via that are going to give uh, provide a gateway to all this information but in a more structural way so it's going to be like the 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 filter in somehow to all this information let's see how how it goes yeah um, I know there's the the data.gov uh, site here in the United States that that federates a lot of um, data from uh, across the country but that is still um, I, I think a, a challenge. I, I see there's there's a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, one from Mike Hernandez asking about feedback loops or processes with consumers of data. Um, did you use any particular frameworks or design methodologies or any sort of co-design with policymakers and data consumers in the same space? And then there's another one from Tim um, asking about our, our stances and opinions on cities, states, and towns that are still standing behind privacy issues and concerns regarding release releasing data sets, I think it's fairly obvious your stance and with the, I think it's fairly obvious your stance with the audience here. Um, so I, I think to Mike's question about the um, the frameworks and design methodologies and feedback loops, do you want to start with that one, Inma? Yes, of course. I can complement a, a bit on that. And then, uh, Zachary, uh, you can explain your, your from your side. So the metadata, uh, so the metadata quality assessment methodology, uh, so the methodology behind um, so it's a tool that we provide uh, through a portal, but it's by a methodology done by, by, by the consortium working for that author about the few. So it was developed uh, originally by Frank Hofer Focus. Um, so really study the, the how like the how the what is the metadata quality uh, like uh, behind uh, the, the different data sets. So there are different here. There's also like different dimensions. So in terms of the keyword usage, the categories, the geo search, uh, the time-based search, the accessibility, uh, interoperability. So um, actually, I can give you um, access to all this information. You can see it yourself. It's true that sometimes it's not it's not perfect. You we may fine tune it in the future, but this is how we're what we're using now because at the time when we saw that it was the methodology for good data quality that was fitting in with uh, what we what we believe. But I'm going to send it to you, actually. And then, uh, Zachary, if you want to share your yeah, views we, on that. We try to have feedback loops in, in most of our work. Um, I, I think one, one thing, and, and this is um, more unidirectional than, than a lot of the other loops, is just we have a service where people can ask questions about a data set, or um, not, not just ask questions, but also nominate a, a data set for publication, where if they think there's some data that exists in city government that an agency is actively managing, but it's not yet public. Um, we, 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 we receive nominations for that data set to be published. And there's a legal requirement then after that for um, the owner of, of that data set to get back within um, a period of time and then to either 
publish the data set, share when it will be published, or explain publicly why it can't be published. Um, so that, that's one example of that kind of feedback loop. I think another is just um, as we think about these different tools we, we have um, and, and that we're putting in place internally, how can we get people involved in that conversation? One way is just sharing them um, with the, the information, so having them available on the open data website, but also actively seeking people out. So when we put together our priorities um, for open data, um, mm -hmm. after our, our 10th anniversary, we had a, a workshop bringing in people from um, different parts of government, um, members of the city's um, civic tech community, members of uh, particular issue advocate groups, and, and having that kind of co-design process. Um, and then I think another example, and actually School of Data last year, um, we were looking at new standards for documentation and had a, a public workshop um, to get people's feedback on those kind of standards. But I think that's always a really important point that, especially um, with open data, we, we can't just do this alone or, or in isolation. That's true. That's absolutely. I cannot agree more. <laughs> Good. Um... I also regarding the, the second question from, from Tim regarding uh, data privacy, it's a constant question that comes every time, especially from data holders that they want to publish the data, because at the end of the day, we're working with public administrations and it's true that they, they have like a, a quite amount of personal data. So here, the, when we're talking about open data, we understand that all the personal data or identification of this personal aspect of the data is completely erased, is completely outside. There was already an anonymization process behind. So um, it's true that sometimes it's one of the main concerns that they may have, that is, but it's true that we can see a shift of, uh, a shift of mindset, uh, especially actually after COVID-19 that we saw how important it is to do, like to undertake data sharing across administrations to understand uh, the, the, like the, like uh, more about this, this pandemic or increased crisis management. We really need this type of, um, this type of uh, information available. So we can see that actually after the COVID-19, uh, after the, the, the outbreak, uh, they're really trying to uh, make this information and transferable in, the, in a way that it can be reusable for governments. And this is why we have also the high value data sets and this legislation uh, passing such as the governance act as well. They really want to uh, emphasize and, and they want to improve the way this data is shared and uh, by default. Yeah, I think the, the idea of, of sharing data, um, especially if it's not something that is um, been done before in a particular municipality, can be kind of scary because you're taking this, this data and information that was previously only accessible to internal employees and it's something that they use in their day-to-day -day lives um, and, and you're making it available to everyone. So um, I, I think some of that... Um, and some of the work that, that we do and, and have done is to um, help people through that process. But ultimately, we're again fortunate that we have um, both a, a robust set of policies, but also a law backing um, what's mm -hmm. being shared. But I think on, on the other hand, there is this, this idea, um, rightfully so, that the internet is forever. So we always, um, when we publish data sets, we're really careful about privacy and, and have a network um, sort of corresponding to the open data coordinators of privacy officers um, around the city and at different city agencies and work with the city's chief privacy officer and their their office on that. But um, I, I think the the topic of, of privacy is is one um, where I think they're legitimately um, something that, that should be addressed very carefully, but also um, obviously something that um, sometimes is, is, is more driven by fear in, in um, in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. I, I fully agree, I fully agree. And uh, for me, it was very interesting also to, to, to see how uh, sometimes we, we are facing, uh, as you were mentioning before, we're facing uh, common challenges, um, but at the same time, we can learn from one another. So these type of activities, these type of events make us like ring the bell and really have an opportunity to, to exchange uh, these best practices. So again, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for participating. Um, it, it's a great reminder that, again, as you were saying, like n none of us are alone in this, that, that, that the challenges that we face are, are the challenges that governments around the world face um, in, in, in slightly different ways, but also in remarkably similar ones for more. But thank you so much, Inma, um, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining today. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I hope you have a nice rest of the day and a nice weekend. Take care, everyone.
Bye, thank you. I'll visit that author about you. <laughs> Bye.